this with godly love. The hours approach where I can't hold still on these things no more. It's too close yeah, to the coming, see? Trinitarianism is of the devil. I say that, thus saith the Lord. God uses normal individuals. Whether it's Smith Wigglesworth or Catherine Kuhlman or Amy or A. Allen or William Branham. Great men of God. Yeshua we do not see as being God when he walked here on earth. We see him as a man. A man anointed by God. A man anointed by God, sent by God to perform a function. Now in his resurrection He's not God. We do not see him as God. We see him as a man anointed by God and that has been restored. There is nothing in the statements of Yeshua, in the statements of the disciples, that would cause one to believe that they were proclaiming that he was deity. With this old cop-out prayer, if it be thy will, bunk. If you have to say that, if it be thy will, or thy will be done, if you have to say that, then you're calling God a fool. I'm going to pray the prayer of faith. Not one of those, Lord, if it be thy will. I don't have to pray a prayer of doubt and unbelief. Because we didn't understand what Jesus said, and because we've been religiously brainwashed instead of New Testament taught, we watered down the promises of God. <coughs> Because God was not his father anymore, he took upon himself the nature of Satan. In what was said about that prophecy, that prophecy never mentioned the Son of God. Never said anything about the Son of God. What did it say? It said, I did not claim to be God. We really begin to understand that, that, that when Jesus Christ paid the price, the first thing that happened after he said it is finished is the veil was rent from top to bottom, signifying that no man could do that. But the price that was paid was there's now no separation. So that we have direct access in the Holy of Holies. We understand, according to Hebrews, that Jesus is our high priest. Absolutely. And he's the first of many brethren, which means I now come into a priestly anointing. So I now can Say that again because now, they don't get it. I now come into a priestly anointing. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. He is not. I'm a Son of he's God. He's the first fruit. You, you're the, he's the first fruit. He's the first born of many. Anointing. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. We get the mind of God about His will. We pray it. When we pray it, we give Him legal right to perform it. Yes. Let me define prayer for you in this show. Prayer is man giving God permission or license to interfere in earth's affairs. In other words, prayer is earthly license for heavenly interference. That's incredible. <laughs> that is incredible. God could do nothing on earth, nothing has God ever done on earth without a human giving him access. So he's always looking for that somebody. Always looking for a human to give him power, permission. In other words, God has the power, but you get the permission. God got the authority and the power, but you got the license. So even though God could do anything, he can only do what you permit him to do. The only creature that God gave authority in the earth, legally to, is a spirit in a dirt body. That means any spirit without a body is illegal on planet earth but here's the bigger statement even God himself is illegal on earth why because he is a spirit and the law he set up by his own mouth was that only spirits with bodies can function on earth legally that's why God could not interfere when Adam and Eve was you know kind of de deliberating on the fruit environment there in the book of Genesis. I mean, it, it bothered me. I'm sure it bothered you for years as a pastor. Uh, if God is so mighty, powerful, awesome, omnipotent, omniscient, why couldn't this mighty God who made 500 million planets and galaxies could not stop a skinny little woman from picking a fruit to destroy his whole program? I mean, come on, God, aren't you powerful? You can intervene. You can destroy the works of the devil, prevent the woman, and save humanity. But he couldn't. Not that he didn't. He couldn't. 
Bible said he measured the heavens with a nine inch span. Now the span is the difference, the distance between the end of the thumb and the end of the little finger. And, and that Bible said, in fact, the Amplified Translation translates the Hebrew text that way, that he measured out the heavens with a nine inch span. Well, I got a ruler and measured mine and my span's eight and three quarter inches long. So now God's span is a quarter of inch, a quarter inch longer than mine. So you see, that faith didn't come billowing out of some giant monster somewhere. It came out of the heart of a being that is very uncanny the way he's very much like you and me. A being that stands somewhere around 6'2", six, 6'3", six, that weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple of hundred pounds, a little better, has a span of eight and, I mean, nine inches across, stood up and said, Lord be! And this universe situated itself and went into motion. Okay. You know, everybody asks, you say, who's the biggest failure? They say, Judas. Somebody else will say, no, I believe it's Adam. Well, how about the devil? He's the most consistent failure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he's not the biggest in terms of material failure and so forth. The biggest one in the whole Bible is God. His top-ranking, most anointed angel, the first man he ever created, first woman he ever created, the whole earth and all the fullness therein, a third of the angels at least. That's a big loss, man. I mean, you figure all that, that's a lot of real estate, brother. Gone down the drain. Now, the reason you don't think of God as a failure is he ain't never said he's a failure. <laughs> no. And you're not a failure till you say you're one. And there's hummingbirds. One lives off dead carcasses, rotting meat. The other lives off the beautiful, sweet nectar in a particular flower on a particular desert plant. In the same desert, they both find what they're looking for. Do you know, take it all the way back into the Old Testament and the Muslim and you, we actually serve the same God, Allah, to a Muslim, to us, Abba Father, God. Do you know, take it all the way back into the Old Testament and the Muslim and you, we actually serve the same God. God gets glory from sickness and disease. Now that is, that just sounds so ridiculous to me now. I've heard the truth for so long. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. So traditional doctrine takes that, verse 28, doesn't look what's around it or what's behind it, and they say, well, you know, you know, all things work together for good. Here, you've just had a car wreck, your leg's broken, your head's all bandaged up, and somebody comes on with the, in with the comforting words, you know, all things work together for those that love God. And you say, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I should have thought of that. Does that make any sense at all? No. It is not Bible that God gets glory from your sickness and disease. He suffered so you and I don't have to go there. Now, if he hadn't suffered it in the spirit as well as the flesh, the flesh cannot make sacrifice for spiritual things. If the flesh could make sacrifice for spiritual things, then the, the, the flesh of animals would have gone a lot closer and a lot further than they did. The spirit then, Jesus' very own holy, pure, sinless spirit, paid the sin price for your spirit. Had to go through that same spiritual death 
in order to pay the price. Now, it wasn't the physical death on the cross that paid the price for sin, because if it had been, any prophet of God that had died for the last couple of thousand years before that could have paid that price. It wasn't physical death. Anybody could do that. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you know something? The minute that blood sacrifice was accepted, Jesus was the first human being that was ever born again. Now, it was sealed. I mean, it happened when he was in hell. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I didn't stop sinning until I finally got it through my sick head. I wasn't a sinner anymore. And the religious world thinks that's heresy, and they want to hang you for it. But the Bible says that I'm righteous, and I can't be righteous and be a sinner at the same time. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I am not poor, I am not miserable, and I am not a sinner. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That is what I were, and if I still was, then Jesus died in vain. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. And Jesus volunteered to go to hell. I'm going to tell you something. Ain't nobody ever got out of there. The only thing he had to go by was the promise of God that I'm reading you right now. He didn't have some special revelation from heaven between he and God the Father. No, the Bible said he emptied himself when he came. And he saw himself in the Word and said, The Spirit of the Lord. But you are the one that has authority over the weather. I've prayed for like a hundred crippled people, not one. He said, that's because I want you to grab that lady's crippled legs and bang them up and down on the platform like a baseball bat. I walked up and I grabbed her legs and I started going, be healed, be healed. I started banging them up and down on the platform. She got healed. And I'm thinking, God, why is not the power of God moving? He said, because you haven't kicked that woman in the face. And there's this older lady worshiping right in front of the platform. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The gift of faith came on me. He said, kick her in the face with your biker boot. I inched closer and I went like this. Bam! And just as my boot made contact with her nose, she fell into the power of God. The beautiful thing on earth is a $100 bill. I hadn't seen a woman as good looking as a $100 bill. There's something about a $100 bill that excites you. My biggest fear is going to hell with all the stupid people in one place. I think I can handle the fire. It's, it's all the fools at the same place. That makes you want to go to heaven, don't it? I mean, <laughs> he said, we don't give to get something back. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> oh, yes, we do. A man came to me and said, Brother Mike, when I give to God, I expect nothing in return. I said, I wrote a little song for you. How dumb thou art, how dumb thou art.